Welcome to the show, guys. Today, we have a very special episode planned. We have Scott Rickens with us today. Now, Scott has spent the last decade leading teams on everything from creative concept to brand strategy and production. He is the founder of 99 Bravo Productions, which is based out of San Diego, California. His work over the past decade has generated literally millions of views, two Emmy nominations, and countless other awards. Most notably, he directed the documentary Inventing to Nowhere, aiming to dispel mythical attacks on America's intellectual property landscape. Scott's been trusted by some of the biggest brands in the world, including Facebook, NBC, Taylor Guitars, Fox, Microsoft, and Wired Magazine. Now, I got to say that even in a vacuum, this would be very impressive, but this is wonderful for us and wonderful for the Fi community because Scott is actually setting aside the next year of his life to focus on producing Playing With Fire, a documentary that uncovers the growing community of frugalist, mustachians, and valuist choosing a path to financial independence and early retirement. And I'm going to plug this right now. If you want to learn more about this project and his work, you can go to playingwithfire.co, playingwithfire.co, and you can get all the latest updates. Uh, He initially reached out to us several months ago to let us know that this is a project that he was interested in looking into. And we have done everything that we could to support that process. And as a result of that, Uh, We wanted to bring him back on the show today and give you a behind the scenes look at his entire journey, how he found Fi, how he found the rabbit hole, where he's coming from and where he's going with this. So this is a very personal, intimate look at what this journey is actually going to look like for him. And also, as this is going to directly affect us, because Fi has never had a documentary, although it's shocking to say this stealth wealth community is finally going to get its airtime on a mainstream format that cannot be ignored. And it's very cool to be able to be behind the scenes on this and get a chance to watch it as it grows. And without any further ado, welcome to the Choose FI radio podcast. You're listening to Choose FI radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. Okay, welcome back. Today, we're going to be featuring an interview from Scott Rickens. And the reason we're featuring this is because Scott reached out to us several months ago to say basically that he has felt the pull to actually give up a year of his life and create a documentary around the FI community. And what is it that we always say? The fire is spreading. Scott found the rabbit hole within the last year and went deep down into it. And it transformed his life and frankly, that of his family as well. And he's making radical changes based on the information that he learned and that he's incorporated incorporating into every aspect of his life. So for two reasons, we felt that this was an extremely important episode. One, to go ahead and get a chance to explore the decisions that Scott has made over the past year and the impact that it's had on him and his immediate family. But then also in the broader context, to go ahead and explore what it looks like to actually give up a year of your life and dedicate it to creating a documentary around this amazing concept, this amazing community, to explore the perimeters of these wildly interesting characters that don't exist in mainstream America that you just don't know about. And you don't know what you don't know until you do. And how incredible would it be to take this message that we all are so passionate about and see it put on a mainstream format like Netflix or Amazon Prime? That's the power of this conversation today. I have Brad here with me in the studio. How you doing, Brad? I am doing great, Jonathan. Yeah, this is exciting. We've gotten to know Scott real well over the last couple of months. And just a, a good guy. And yeah, can't wait to really share him with the broader FI community. So Scott's here with us in the studio as well. How you doing, Scott? Hi, guys. I'm doing great. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely thrilled. This is a conversation that we have been wanting to have. We've been trying to figure out how to do it in the right way. And frankly, Brad and I came to the conclusion that ultimately we should just start with your story. And how you found this rabbit hole. Do you want to tell us maybe a little bit about your background and how you got here? 
Yeah, absolutely. I don't know how far back I want to go, but my wife and I, we've been working hard really since high school and we've done well for ourselves. And I think in due part, because we've had a lot of opportunity and our parents have taught us well and set us up so that we knew debt was bad and we knew we needed to go to college and we needed to work hard and get our homework done and things like that. But through all of that, we also have a bit of a wanderlust and adventure streak. And, you know, we moved around quite a bit. I was a Navy brat growing up and I moved around a lot. And my wife and I both share that excitement for travel and adventure. And it, we ended up finding ourselves in, on a little island called Coronado off of San Diego. It's a pretty ideal place. We've got beach, we've got palm trees, we're next to a major metropolitan city that's growing. For all intents and purposes, it's it's awesome. But despite all of that, there was always this nagging feeling that I couldn't shake. Um, a nagging feeling that it felt like the more success that we were finding and the harder we were working, the more would come up and the busier we would get. And the next thing you know, we had a baby and our lives changed completely. Our obligations started to mount, our priorities changed. And man, I just, I felt like we were on a hamster wheel as the Phi community calls it. And I would wake up in the morning, kiss my wife and kid, and I would head out the door to pay for this lifestyle. But I was rarely enjoying it myself. And when I would actually get the time to enjoy it, I couldn't shake this feeling. And so for me, I always knew that it was about financial independence. I always knew if we had financial independence that we could make decisions outside of the scope of financial gain. And for me, the only logical explanation to do that was to come up with some million dollar idea, uh, to come up with some new invention. And frankly, I've been working on that for years. I have a million of them. They're all ridiculous. And I would think about pursuing one here or there and I'd start stoking the flames and call some of my friends and or people I knew that I thought could help me or get something done. But it would always kind of fizzle because I'd also have to focus on my day job. And um, being an entrepreneur, there's just you want to be careful not juggling too many things at once. I love what you have come to recognize over over that journey. And, and what I'm seeing is that when you look at most of these entrepreneur type websites, most of these side hustle type websites in a vacuum is just earn more. It's very one dimensional. The way you beat the game is to come up with one single idea that's a million dollar idea and you break the game because you've made millions and millions of dollars. That's what I see almost everybody striving to do. What we've recognized and where I think we're going to go with this is the missing piece was always starting from a strong financial base and it gives you so much more freedom because it frees you from the hamster wheel, which then allows you to then tackle that other side, that entrepreneurial side again, right? That's exactly right. And I think what's really interesting about all of that that you just mentioned is the entrepreneurial side. There seems to be an entrepreneurial bent to all of this. I think you guys just had Alan on a little while ago. And the whole side hustle thing being such a major pillar of FI, it's really interesting. I think a lot of people have probably gone down a similar path as I have, but just maybe haven't gone this one step further to, to find FI. And I ended up diving into the startup culture. And for me, I'm actually uh, a bit of a podcast junkie. I'm really a Reddit browser and and I really like to read. I'm not so much of a blog reader or I hadn't been. And I had dove down the rabbit hole of podcasts and found a lot of side hustle type podcasts that focus on uh, startup culture or uh, raising money. The Dorm Room Tycoon was one. Pat Flynn's podcast, Entrepreneur on Fire. And that all took me down a rabbit hole. I also, being in the creative space, uh, listened to Chase Jarvis Live when they first came out. And that is when I found Tim Ferriss. And I was aware of Tim Ferriss via the four hour work week, but I never read it. I just would always see it on the shelf at various uh, marketing agencies or co-working spaces that I was around, but hadn't actually read the book. And I started listening to his podcast. And this was right around the time that we had our baby and we had we were in the middle of a move and I had a lot of time to listen. And so I took a deep dive into the Tim Ferriss podcast and learned a ton. And but at the same time, through all of this learning, you know, I never hit on an idea that I found was was impactful enough or big enough to really pursue to the extent that I knew I would need to to succeed. And that brought a ton of stress. 
it's that it's that component that when you're trying to just increase your income to outpace your lifestyle creep and with every additional dollar you get you just get the next thing on that bucket list that inevitably has some cost attached to it and usually it's recurring cost and so the bar keeps getting raised which then raises the ante for the level of side hustle or business that you need to create or the level of awesomeness of the next idea you need to have and when you're just looking at the problem with that from that one dimension you can't win and guys if Anybody knows anything about lifestyle creep, it's me. When my wife and I moved here to Coronado, our first place was 565 square feet. All right, we lived really minimally. Uh, We kept our bikes on our patio. We didn't have kids. We lived in a little one bedroom with our dog and we paid, I think, something like 900 or 1100 bucks a month, which at that time, it was 2012, it was at the bottom of the market and that was expensive for us. It was very expensive for us. And and through the five years that we've lived here in Coronado, we've upgraded uh, three times and each time the rent would go up and we would have other additional expenses and then we had more space so we'd buy things to fill that space. If anybody knows lifestyle creep, it's me. And we got all the way to the point where we are living in a three bedroom, three bath. It's about 1,400 square feet. We're paying 2850 a month. And I'm looking at that going, I think that's that's like a, a, a mortgage on a, a 15 year mortgage on a 400, maybe 425, $450,000 home. Wow. That's um, crazy. Hey, Scott, uh, so that's tripling your living expense in just a handful of years, right? So you went from 900 and change to 2,800. So, I mean, talk us through, because we're always curious about like the psychology behind why people make decisions, right? So like you guys, I assume many of these three moves happened before your child was born, right? Like talk us through the actual decision making on, hey, we have this 560 some odd square foot place. Like why do we need the bigger place? Why do we need the next bigger place? I'm, I'm just curious if you don't mind. Not at all. Uh, the first place, I think we had a pretty good reason. We ended up, we secured the place before we actually moved here. And what we learned later was that we were living on the road where the ambulance would come drop people off at the ER. <laughs> and <Nice>. so <laughs> in the middle of the night, we were getting woken up quite often. <laughs> I'm someone who sleeps in like a hermetically sealed room, essentially, like with white noise machines and stuff. So yeah, I can understand uh, not wanting an ambulance right next door. That is hilarious. I actually remember at the camp mustache that we were at at the <laughs> beginning of the year, Brad actually moved out of the room that he was in and found a closet in, a, in an abandoned area of the building. <laughs> and yes, I, I literally like, slept in a closet. <laughs> <laughs> but it was great. I had a single. I- That's awesome. Yeah. So you guys get it. <laughs> I get it. I get it. That's intense. I can definitely understand that first move. Yeah. The first move makes sense to me too. Um, um, but as we started to look around the island, you know, the other thing was we we had been here for about a year, year and a half, and we had kind of found our place here and and started making more money. Um, so we had a little more money to spend. And, you know, you start looking around and going, well, if we spent this much a month, what could we get? And this much a month, what could we get? So we found this high rise just south of the ho- the iconic Hotel Dell, right on the beach. They've got like nine different towers with five pools and the pools are right on the Pacific Ocean. I mean, it's an insanely beautiful place to live. It was just kind of a special place. And, and it was on the ninth floor. We could see we had a view of the bay and on the other side was the ocean. It was it was pretty insane. And And obviously, we could talk ourselves into uh, justifying a higher rent uh, to live there. And that just continues. Once you move in there, you got to have some stand-up paddle boards. You've got to get your surfboards. You've got to get a rack on your vehicle to transport those around. That's one of a million examples. And the next thing you know, uh, you know, we're we're not really saving a whole lot more, even though we're making a whole lot more. And that has continued all the way up. And now, now with the child... To be honest, that place uh, that place was something like seven or eight hundred square feet, and it was a little tight. We had a little Harry Potter baby. Uh, she was living in the closet. Uh, we sort of we sort of <laughs> <laughs> we sort of uh, uh, redecorated our closet to be a little uh, nursery, and it w- it really worked for us for a while. But we we saw the writing on the wall. Our baby was going to grow, and uh, the closet wasn't going to work anymore. So. <laughs> Covered um, under the stairs, right? <laughs> Quite literally. <laughs> so we definitely needed to find more space, but uh, what a daunting task once again. And remember, this is now a couple more years down the road and the economy's improved and people are moving here and the secret's out. Coronado is definitely a place that everybody or a lot of people have heard of at this point. And honestly, I, I remember when our beach won like number one beach in the country three years ago, I want to say. And I'll never forget that summer. It was 
chaos. I mean, the amount of people walking down Orange Avenue was incredible. You've um, never been so disappointed to get recognition for something for a place that you live. It just it felt like a stab in the gut. Absolutely. Absolutely. There is something to a best kept secret and <laughs> it is no longer a best kept secret. And so uh, trying to get out of that tower and and onto the island with a little more space was was daunting. We ended up making it work. My parents living here for so long, they had some connections and uh, we knew someone who had a place and we ended up getting in. What's really funny is it's an amazingly reasonable price for the island. $2,850 a month for a three bedroom, three bath, 1400 square foot place with no yard. Can I just um, pause you on that and just say for a second, what you just said there is the logic that I think millions of people use to just stay fixed in their current environment. And, and they never look outside of that. And they say, well, my, you know, everybody in this geographic area is paying 3,600 or $4,000 for something about the same price because I'm paying 2850. We just shouldn't complain. This is perfect. And, and you're never willing to look outside of that. And I think what's interesting about where this story may be going soon is that when you do decide that that construct is false and, and you decide to take a further step out, you can turn the game on its head and, and many people will never consider this. They, they just won't. They won't even take a second look at it. I totally agree. And so, yeah, to get back to my little journey, once I found Tim Ferriss's podcast, that was just a daily listen for me or weekly. And one day, I'll never forget it. It was February. I believe it was February 13th of this year. Mr. Money Mustache pops up, how to live frugally on twenty five dollars to $27,000 a year. That podcast literally opened my eyes. I was listening to this and thinking, what? These are ideas that I... I always dreamed of, but never knew existed. And then to find out as I started diving down that rabbit hole that there was a whole network of people focused on hacking the system and living a life of happiness by gaining financial independence, that was that was actually a line I hadn't drawn yet for myself. The idea that you could pursue a life of happiness and focus less on your financial gain or how much you're making or what kind of cash you're bringing in, but that this was really all a pursuit of happiness. That was amazing to me. And, and the other side of it was this idea of retiring early. I'd never heard of that before, other than people who would hit it big or get their startup funded and then sell for billions or you know things like that. And what's really funny too is I, I wonder if other people have had the same nagging thought but I hear about people making tons of money in a five, $10 million exits, and they were still grinding it out. You'd, you'd hear about them later, especially on all those startup podcasts I was listening to. You'd hear about them just grinding and stressing over the next big idea. And I always thought to myself, if I did that, I would be going and buying my cute little place in that sort of small to medium sized town. And that would be it. I mean, but that being said, as an aspiring jack of all trades, master of none, early retirement means I'd have more time with my family and more time to pursue interesting trades and crafts and experiments and things that strike me daily. And, and that to me sounded like, I don't know, the best life. And so this just totally resonated with me on levels that I'm sure most people can understand <laughs> on this podcast. But you're yeah, definitely was, talking to a very friendly audience. And I think a lot of us are soaking this idea up right along with you. And it's interesting to me that you listen to these podcasts and you thought while you had these thoughts in your mind, you thought it was impossible, right? You thought it was, oh, I need to have an exit for $10 million to do this. And then I assume, because I listened to that Tim Ferriss episode as well, and I know that the number is nowhere near five to 10 million for Mr. Money Mustache. So, I mean, that must have just really caused like this paradigm shift in your mind to, wow, this is impossible or, oh, this is for a select tiny minority of people to, wow, maybe this is conceivable in my own life. That's exactly where I went, Brad. And yes, yeah, that's exactly how I felt. To not only hear about ways to reposition the way we think about our spending, and that's something we'd always thought about, we talked about, we downloaded Mint, I had started to attempt to set up budgets and things like that, but we would always kind of fall off the wagon and not really take it seriously. A couple of months, we decided, oh, let's give ourselves $500 cash a month and kind of, <laughs> we were trying to find ways to, to rein in our spending responsibly and whatnot. But you know, there was never a huge incentive to because we were doing all right. We, we were saving, we were definitely saving in our 401ks and in our Roths and things like that. But, but we never really saw our savings account go up. And that was that lifestyle creep that kept coming in, even though we were making more. And so to find this idea that, wait, I don't need to make 10 million dollars to retire early. The idea that you could actually sort of take a slow sip 
on uh, on your earnings for a long extended period of time and that it wasn't that difficult to realize was a game changer. It was a total game changer. And then what was really cool was to go from learning all of that to then discovering Frugal Woods and JL Collins and the wealthy accountant and the mad scientists and Coach Carson and Vicki Robin, all of these people that were sort of, they were either talking about what it was like in practice or going down a deeper rabbit hole on some of these various themes and ideas and, and ways. It was really cool to see that and to, to see that there was more options to sort of soak up all of this information. And I'm sure you guys understand, you know, once you get excited about something, you can't get enough. And so, uh, yeah, it was just amazing to, to, to learn about all these fascinating folks who had really set up a lot of blogs and podcasts to share their experiences and learn with others. And what I, what I loved about it the most, what I loved about it the absolute most was I found an incredible community who actually seemed to treat each other with respect, expand on ideas, they challenged each other and seemed to get to know each other even in the comment sections of blogs. I mean, how many online communities can you say that about where well, you actually see respect? One of the things that's interesting, and, I, and I'd love to hear your perspective on this, is so you have now found the FI community and you've gone deep and you found all these influencers that frankly have had an impact on my life as well. So I can appreciate what you're saying. But now what I'm wondering is you've kind of been a victim of lifestyle creep, if you want to say, or you've let this lifestyle creep occur for the last several years. And now you're, you've decided to make a change, but you're also married. Y your wife, was she on board with this? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So my, my family, uh, they know that I get excited about things and and then I kind of get all consumed by them. And there's probably a little bit of head padding going on. And OK, here we go again. And I, I think they all love me for it. But but this was something that wasn't going away. <laughs> and basically, I started to slowly share my discoveries with my wife. And I, honestly, they the discoveries were met with a, a whole heck of a lot of skepticism. And that's probably part and due to my fault in the sense of what she's used to. But also, I think some of the things I was telling her, because I would really share the big discoveries, the big aha moments, I honestly, I think they they were probably just too good to be true to her. And so what I did was I slowly started to sort of tease some articles to her. And I can't thank Mr. Money Mustache enough for this forever is that I think what what's so special about him is the way he puts things into perspective. It just it, it's hard to argue. And uh, they're so well thought out, well researched and well put that they're hard to argue against. And so that whole skepticism, because you're hearing all of these ideas probably for the first time, and you've never heard them before. And you, and I think one of my first thoughts, and I believe one of my wife's first thoughts was, well, why isn't everybody doing this then? And you almost say it in the sense of, so I don't believe you. <laughs> and right. so, you know, and so that's, that was, that was really exciting. And so I would share some of those major uh, blogs with her. I think I honestly set up the path that Mr. Money Mustache sets. I think there are about four blog posts that he recommends right off the bat. And I teased those out. I teased them to my wife. I teased them to her parents and my own. I wanted people to read these things. And and, you know, I, I waited a little while. I was actually patient because I knew that there, I knew I, sh I shouldn't take all that credit. I had a gut feeling that this was a big deal and um, I wanted to do it right. And I got really lucky. But I, I actually had a stroke of clarity one day and realized I should look into this and see if there's any suggestions on how to introduce this. And so you decided to use a strategy. <laughs> <laughs> you decided to leave the blunt hammer at home. <laughs> I thought a soft touch might actually work in this case. Yeah. And Scott, it's so funny when you were describing yourself as somebody who dives into things and the people around you, you people who love you kind of maybe look at you like, oh, here he goes again. Jonathan and I looked at each other and we're both thinking we do the exact same thing. Jonathan, maybe a little more than I do. <laughs> Brad was pointing at me. He's yeah, trying I, to he's was, trying to be nice now. <laughs> <laughs> I was pointing at him because he sounds like the exact parallel. <laughs> if my wife were listening to this right now, she would be like, oh, no. <laughs> Another one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, like I said, a moment of clarity and total stroke of luck. I, I managed to bring a little strategy into it. And I found, I don't remember anymore how I found this or, or who I was listening to or what I read, but I loved this idea of framing it around happiness. And I knew that that would be the way to my wife's heart. 
and into her mind because I know that that's important to her. You know, we do share a lot of the same interests and goals and and, and that's why we're happily married. And I know that this is a, a major point to, to the FIRE community and I've heard this discussed on your podcast and, and many other places. And it's funny to hear, I believe, Jonathan, you were even talking about how the dynamics between, uh, I think it took you a while to come around. It's interesting to hear people's hesitation towards this. And I'm sure there's a ton of reasons for it. And it probably stems a lot from people's past, probably to some extent, some fear of the future. But for my wife and I, if we're anything, we, we do try to pursue happiness. And um, and hence, hence moving to this insanely expensive island. It was, well, everybody says that's crazy, so let's do it. And so I just asked her to write down a list. I said, please just write down five to 10 things that make you happy on a weekly basis. And the weekly thing was interesting because one of the things I've learned from this, I think one of the most impactful light bulb moments for me heading down this path has by far and away been this idea of stop looking at expenses on a monthly basis and look at it on a 10 year basis. That is a game changer for me, regardless of whether we even invest our money well in the future or if the stock markets that have been on an absolute tear start crumbling down. At the very least, I know that if I'm looking at the long term ideas of 10 years, if I'm looking at the long term implications of our financial actions over 10 years that we're going to be better off. And and so to put that in framework for her, I thought this is going to be a long term process. So let me start thinking about what the short term implications are. And when it comes to happiness, I thought, okay, we'll write down a list of the five to 10 things that make you happy on a weekly basis. And and I actually I, I brought the list with me. I thought we might talk about this today. And I have it right here. And here is my wife's list. Read her baby a book. Listen to her baby laugh have coffee with her husband, have a glass of wine at night, eat delicious chocolate, ride bikes with our family, go for a walk, and spend time with our parents and our family. I noticed that spending <laughs> money is nowhere on that list. The only two things that cost money are wine and chocolate. And so I thought to myself, there's the compromise. You can have your wine and chocolate if you will follow me on this journey. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I've never heard that anywhere else. And my <laughs> wife will soak that up as well. I'm, I'm absolutely going to duplicate that. But that is fantastic. And yes, Scott, the focus on happiness is what I know I talk about all the time here on this podcast. Phi allows us to kind of step outside of our regular lives, right? The hamster wheel that we talked about earlier. Everyone just goes through the motions. And you just kind of do things habitually and you don't think about it, right? You don't put the space between the stimulus and the response. It just happens automatically. And when you stop and say, oh, wow, there's a different way to look at life. Take that pause. Then you can focus on what's important. And the way that you approach it with your wife, I think is absolutely brilliant, which is focusing on happiness, right? And realizing that these things are about connection, human connection. I say this over and over here and every single thing on this list is is precisely that. And it costs very little money, wine and chocolate. So that I think was a brilliant way to approach it. And when you frame it in with happiness and long-term happiness, and then, oh, financial stability for decades to come. I mean, this is such like a winning strategy and such a winning approach to life that, yeah, I, I'm very impressed. So just wanted to uh, jump in there with that. Yeah, that's great. I, I agree. And the other thing that was really interesting about this list was nearly all of these things were agnostic to our location. This, this beautiful and insanely expensive island of Coronado in the beautiful and insanely expensive state of California. Ultimately, we can ride bikes, go for walks, spend time with our families, listen to our baby laugh nearly anywhere. And so that really took me down another rabbit hole, which was, do we need to leave? And California, the, the state income tax here is pretty nuts. It has to be one of the most expensive states in this country, if not the most. I think New York is right up there, maybe Illinois. And I started looking around and my wife is actually from the Pacific Northwest. I'm from the Midwest and uh, Washington State, my wife's from a little town outside of Seattle and Washington State has 0% state income tax. <laughs> you talk about arbitrage at its finest. Let's go, Tim Ferriss. I did a, I did a little research and found out, I, I believe he actually coined the term geo arbitrage. Is that his? Uh, is that ownership, Brad? 
I don't know. I mean, I know he's been talking about that for a decade at least. So yeah, it wouldn't, wouldn't shock me. But yeah, I'm not sure precisely. He might. You, you might have made a point there. I'll have to look into that. Yeah. And geo arbitrage was for me the easiest first step because we, we don't mind moving, or at least I don't. Being a being Navy brat, I moved like 13 times before I got to high school. And so I started looking around and realized, and I'll share some, some details with you guys. I realized that if we moved out of the state of California and we're able to continue to earn the level that we were earning, we would save close to $20,000 a year just by moving to another state. And I did a little calculation, and if we were to invest that 20K into investments over 10 years with a 5% rate of return, we'd have $251,721 just for moving. Wow, that's amazing. That does not include the cost of living savings (laughs) that we will absolutely achieve moving out of one of the most expensive zip codes in this country. Right, because everything is less expensive when you leave those high cost of living areas. I know, yeah, when I left Long Island, New York and moved to Richmond, it's it's everything. It's things that you don't even think of. I mean, obviously food, but even just like car insurance. My car insurance is maybe a quarter of what it was on Long Island. And it's just, you you have many, many of these things. So yeah, I totally hear you there. And one of the things is your business is, is more or less location independent, right? Am I right about that? We are very blessed. My wife is, uh, she works remote and her work is remote. Uh, it is focused on the West Coast, so we will have to stay on the West Coast. Probably the furthest east we can go is Denver. And for me, yeah, as a video producer, there's there's a lot of work all over this country. And I've established a pretty successful video production company with a couple guys here in San Diego. We've done very well for ourselves. Uh, but, you know, I would say 80% of our work uh, was out of town. And so it is very location agnostic. So we are we are very blessed in that in that light. And honestly, we intend to continue to pursue interests that will be able to keep us remote. Hey, Scott, so just to go back for a minute. So you said a quote there that it was really fascinating to me. The easiest first step, you said, was moving. And now that is fascinating because for most people, that's the hardest step. You know, I know a ton of people from from back home in New York who I talk to about this and it sounds great in theory and they'd love to make a move like we did but there's just that pull of home, right? And it's not easy to leave family and friends and a place that you've known for decades. And now I understand, obviously, like you said, you're a Navy brad and you've moved around, but it sounds like Coronado is home at this point for you. So to me, when you said that, like the easiest first step is moving, that that's a very interesting statement. And I'd love to hear like, so from when you first approach your wife with, hey, I heard this podcast, let's make a list of what makes you happy to we're moving, you know, like talk, talk me through that process. Cause that's not like for most people, that's not an overnight thing. It's not like in one week we decide, Hey, I listened to a podcast. We're moving, right? Like talk, <laughs> talk me through that. This is the impetus for a lot of the eye rolling I get from my family. <laughs> I get a little ahead of myself and uh, thank you for bringing me back down to earth. You're right. I look at it like that. My wife does not. Uh, she grew up living in one place her whole life. And like I said, has that wanderlust, but absolutely Coronado's become home to both of us. But I think it's going to be a lot harder for her to move than it is for me. I've moved and moved out of this place so many times. It kind of feels like second nature. I don't get tied to one place, uh, but I totally understand that. And I honestly, you know, my entire family from my mom and my dad's side nearly all live in one small town in Iowa. And I am blessed to be able to go back and see my huge extended family and most or all of them when I go back. And so I understand the pull to stay in a place like that where you do have that extended family and you have that help for childcare and for all the little things that come up, the support system of family can't be denied. There's no doubt. And I think something that's really important to mention here is you can pursue these things without moving. There is no doubt about that. I mean, just getting a grasp on your expenses and knowing where to put the excess money is by far and away a lesson that I don't know about you guys, but growing up, I don't know a lot of people that really had a huge education in that. And if they did, they weren't sharing it with me. And that's what I love about this so much is that there's so much sharing going on. But to get back to the moving idea is for for me, that was the bet. That was the easiest short term decision to make to find major, major gains. And that is specific to our situation being how we live in an incredibly expensive zip code in an incredibly expensive state. I would say people who live in those expensive states probably feel that 
and know and feel that a little more coming from me. But there's there's a lot of places in this country that just don't even touch this cost of living. And so so yeah, for us in our particular situation, that was a main driver. But this wasn't a decision that happened overnight. And we looked at it really hard. And one of the things that I kind of came to use as sort of an impetus was I'm in this job that's nine to five that keeps me away from my family. If I get out of that job and we move, our savings alone from making that happen will justify me quitting my job. And so if I give myself a year to pursue a documentary and really pursue my dreams as an independent filmmaker, I mean, who can argue with that? So what does that actual conversation look like with your wife? How do you go about saying, you know what, let's do this. Let's make this actual move. We know that we can make it work, but how do you actually get her to say yes to this vision? Yeah, so the thing is, is whether we move to Washington or not, it, it was it's really about um, this geo-arbitrage idea. And that was something, I mean, moving my wife out of this place that is so idyllic and perfect for her, um, was not going to be easy. And, and, you know, it's not absolutely necessary by any means. But for me, I started thinking about it. And I realized, okay, we're paying an insane amount of money in rent. We have two full time jobs, we need to pay a nanny to watch our child. So now I'm paying somebody to watch my kid when I would rather watch my kid. And I'm going to work to raise the money necessary to pay that person. So half of my day is spent just working so that I can afford to have somebody else watch my my child. Feels like that, a hamster wheel. That is the definition, right? And so I started looking at that and thinking, okay, not only will we save X amount by moving from this state to a state that's cheaper, because nearly every state in the country is cheaper than this one, we'll also save so much money on rent, on childcare, on cost of living in general. And I started looking at that against my own salary and realized that we could maybe make this into sort of an adventure. Why don't we spend some time looking into the places we're considering thinking about moving to? I mean, my wife and I have been sort of, you know, Zillow addicts for years where we'll just kind of go on there and look in our own areas or look in what we hear is an upcoming neighborhood or look in other cities that maybe we go and explore or visit just to see what the cost of living is like. We're kind of, we love real estate. We always have. And so we started looking into some of these various cities. We looked at Bend, Oregon and Boise, Idaho and Fort Collins, Colorado and Spokane, Washington. And these are all areas where we feel like we can really hit some geo arbitrage where we, the cost of living is significantly lower than what we're accustomed to. And I thought, why don't we make this a year long adventure? I had a job that I was going to nine to five. I liked the job, but I was spending a lot of time there. Um, and I didn't feel like my returns were were equal to that amount of time. And that cost of living was actual life with my family. That was the cost to me. And so I sort of came to my wife and just, and just pitched this to her. Hey, what if I quit my job? What if we go across the country for the next year. And what if we go live with your parents for a couple of months up in Seattle in the summer when it's absolutely perfect? And then we go to Iowa and live with my parents for a couple of months in the fall in Iowa when it's absolutely beautiful and give them a chance to spend as much time as we can with our kid. And there's nothing better than that. And then after we've geo arbitraged with our in-laws for a while, we've saved up a nice amount of money and we can go and spend some time in these places that we're thinking about living and really understand what it's like to live there. Spend a month there instead of a weekend and make a really rational and educated decision on what's the next place where we can still achieve a lot of the same things that we love about Coronado, you know, like bike riding and parks and a sense of community and being able to bike ride to the grocery store and, and all and all these things. And that was sort of the, the push. And I pitched it to her and it wasn't like an overnight success thing, but one morning we were bike riding over to swim lessons, actually, with our little uh, like 18 month old. And it's just like the best Saturday morning, you know, heading down to the pool and she's all excited with her little helmet. And it's just like, it's so perfect. And we're just we're happy. But and, and, and that makes it even more difficult to make the decision. And I'm riding alongside my wife. And I'm thinking what's going on through her head is probably I can't believe he's making me move. And she turns to me and says, what if we get a camper and do all of this on the road? Wow. <laughs> I, was, I was like, Ah, oh, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's so many different things here. One is that you're fixated now on the pursuit of happiness, that 
you're thinking, how can I game this out to claw back my time and increase my happiness and that of my family? And what you find is that money goes from being the primary focus to now a tool that you can use to buy your freedom and also allow you to pursue this happiness. I think that's kind of this restructuring, this reframing. And I love that as you start to get closer and closer to this concept, that reframing is the same thing that has occurred in in my life as well. And what I find ultimately, it is not the pursuit of money for me. Getting a, a larger paycheck does not ultimately do it for me. In fact, I'm willing to make less in order to have more happiness. I think I think that's just a very interesting kind of reframing of a situation. And it doesn't have to be that way. Certainly, you could make more. You could hit it big. But when your focus is the pursuit of your family's happiness. You don't need to make the multi six figure income. You're able to make decisions based on what will make you happy. And it's not necessarily about income either. You're talking about major, major expenses, Scott, that you're going to cut out immediately, right? $28.50 a month is $34,000 a year. Plus, if you're paying a nanny, which you're talking about, I mean, I imagine that has to be fairly expensive in California, right? So we were paying twenty five hundred a month wow. for childcare. Holy cow. Okay, that's even more. So just right there, that's sixty four thousand dollars a year, and that's after tax money. So I mean, that's <laughs> crazy, crazy. I mean, if you're in a high income tax bracket, that's a hundred grand of pre tax income. I mean, just spending on your nanny and on your rent. So I mean, that is gone. I mean, that's a hundred thousand dollars. Annually. That's, yeah. That's inc- absolutely incredible. So now take yeah. that and put that in your 10-year projection. <laughs> Game changer. That's yeah. exactly right. And you know, the light bulb for my wife that got her to the point where we were riding our bikes to swim lessons and her suggesting that we rent a camper or buy a camper for a year was when I ran the calculations on the length in which it would take for us to retire based off of a few parameters. We, I said to my, I showed my wife, if we can get our expenses down to $50,000 a year, which I think is relatively reasonable. And from what I hear is very reasonable, uh, according to uh, this community online that I've been researching. It's pretty much impossible uh, in your current environment, right? Almost literally impossible in our current environment. Yes, we we could do it in San Diego, but we'd have to move so far east. We'd be living in 120 degree desert. And so, yes, it's nearly impossible where we're at. And I ran that and I said, OK, if we can maintain our earnings and get our expenses down to fifty thousand dollars a year with our current net worth, we're projected to retire in about five to seven years. Nice. <laughs> wow. and, and that is that was so pivotal for me, for her. That was met with a ton of skepticism at first, but I think that started to wash over. And I think that's, I think that started to really frame it out for her. She was saying, okay, even if you're wrong on a pretty decent scale, we're still looking at 10 or 12 years. Let's double it, say 14. That's still significantly less time than we had assumed prior. And I think that's really what got her there. And so that was, that was our journey. And, you know, for me, I really, I really started thinking about it. And I thought we're in a really unique position. We I'm quitting my job. We're picking up our life. We're going to go check out a bunch of different states. And it's going to be hard. I'm talking about this with enthusiasm, guys, because I'm excited. I'm personally excited for the journey for the adventure. And I'm used to this stuff. You know, I was brought up this way. Um, But not everybody is. And I I just want to make sure it's very clear. I know that there's going to be a lot of trial and tribulation. This is not going to be all roses all the time. And At the same time, I thought, you know, one of the things that this community has given me is this light bulb moment, this idea that we can actually get out of this grind, out of this hamster wheel, spend more time with our family, our daughter, becoming happy. And ultimately, this takes us down a lot of other paths where if we have that much free time and we have additional capital, you start looking at effective altruism and philanthropy and things like that, that I have always wanted to pursue. I mean, everything from the lionfish taking over the coral reefs in the Keys to cleaning up the beaches over here on the West Coast to cures for the blind. I mean, there's a lot of pursuits that matter to me, that matter to my wife, that we would love to spend time doing, but we've gotten ourselves in a situation where we don't even have the time barely to spend with with our family, with ourselves, with our friends, to have extra time to spend on, on those in need. And all of this just adds up. And I thought, we're in this really unique position to spend the next year of our life pursuing this. And what if we can document that? And while we pursue this, can we go around and actually meet these people that have given us such a gift and learn more from them, learn who they are, learn about these eclectic characters, this mishmash of people all over the world 
who have come together online to figure out a way to hack our, our lives uh, in today's society. I, I, that, that is such an exciting story to tell. And to think that I could somehow allow and give people a perspective to eliminate as many excuses as possible to pursue this lifestyle, while also showcasing the incredible characters that are involved in this community. To me, that's uh, that's a pursuit worth taking a year off for, taking a year to explore. I don't know how I lose in that situation. So yeah, that's what we decided to do. And my wife's on board and super supportive and as she always is, and she thinks I'm crazy and um, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Wow, that's incredible. I can't believe how that story comes together. That's a light bulb moment for me on so many different levels. And it's such a contrast because most people, especially those stuck on the hamster wheel, spend all their free time, their very limited amount of free time, just doing laundry and landscaping because every other minute they have is dedicated to their nine to five. I want to be in the community that has utterly crushed the hamster wheel by being willing to make some slightly more optimized choices over an extended period of time. They have purchased their freedom and now they can dedicate that space to the people they care about and the projects they get passionate about. They're exploring these ideas like this effective altruism. How cool is it to have this community that's focused on these ideas, to see what these people are doing with their free time, to see how people come from different walks of life and explore this very cool world where time is a tool that they have in their back pocket. What do you do when your entire day is not locked down to the mundane activities of the hamster wheel? Very inspiring, Scott. Thank you so much for sharing. And Scott, what I'm struck by is time, but in a different way. So we're actually recording this on July 13th, and the Mr. Money Mustache episode with Tim Ferriss came out on February 13th. So that's five months, right? So Mm. you got in touch with us, what has to be probably two months ago at this point, right? So three months, you made the decision. You knew nothing about this. You dove in as much as you possibly could. You had this life-changing conversation with your wife and then decided to take a year of your life on this adventure and create this documentary. I mean, that is a remarkable timeline in every possible way, right? Like that is truly incredible to me. So lead us up to when you got in touch with us, when you got in touch with other people in the FI community, when this documentary became became real. Absolutely. You know, I had been diving into all of this, all of these resources online. And I came across your podcast by searching for podcasts that Mr. Money Mustache had appeared on or had been talked about on. You know, I was soaking up radical personal finance and the mad scientist and I found Choose Fi. And I thought one of the things that you guys gave to me and my wife was the Pillars of Fi episode. That episode was one that I sent to my wife early on. And she came back from a, she was driving up to LA on a, on a work trip. And on the way back, she asked me for a podcast to listen to. And I sent her that one. I felt like that was a really nice, succinct way to sort of put all this into a bottle and say, here, this is essentially what we're talking about doing. <laughs> and she came back raving about how she felt like Jonathan and Brad were guys that she could relate with. And that was something that I hadn't really realized before, that she was looking for something maybe a little more relatable. And I even had put that particular episode in an email that I was starting to send out to friends and family who I would inevitably talk about this subject matter with, and they'd asked me for more information. So I ended up putting together an email that kind of laid out in succession how they should consume the major ideals. And that included some blogs from some blog posts from Mr. Money Mustache and the Mad Scientist and some podcasts like Tim Ferriss and from your podcast. And I felt like it absolutely fit within that framework. Uh, But she came back just so excited because she felt like it was so relatable in a way that she could take it in and really process it and maybe even share it with her friends and her family in a way that made her comfortable. And so I can't thank you guys enough for that. But that was a major, major pillar of what brought me to you in the first place is I thought, okay, if I'm going to make this documentary, I need to start meeting people within this community and start getting to know them and and start getting on their radar, to be honest, because I've been doing video production for a long time. And to get in and interview somebody to get in and to learn more about their lives, you know, there's a there's a major level of trust that needs to be established and there's that barrier that needs to be broken down very quickly. And with with you guys seeming so relatable, I thought it might be a great way to to sort of kick everything off. And knowing that uh, you had an up and coming podcast and yet that Brad had been a part of this community for a long period of time, I thought, what better way than to talk to you guys and hopefully 
kind of throw this idea off of you and see if you guys think it would be a good idea. I believe the first time we spoke, I even asked, uh, are you familiar with any other documentaries out there that I haven't found? <laughs> Just to make sure, because I honestly, to some extent, I felt like pinching myself when I when I realized that there hadn't been really any extensive video work done around this community at all. It's mm-hmm. shocking, isn't it? I think I've mentioned before. I mean, I was just watching one the other day called Fed Up talking about processed food. I've seen actually, I haven't watched all these, but I know for a fact that there have been several documentaries about different subcultures, uh, anything from King of Kong looking at arcade subculture to Dogtown and the Z-Boys looking at skate culture. Health and wellness has gotten several documentaries as well. I mentioned Fed Up earlier, but uh, more in like the bodybuilding vein, you've seen things like Pumping Iron. I mean, and certainly there have been thousands of documentaries that have highlighted unique aspects of different cultures. There was an entire documentary about people that appreciate Star Trek, but how is it that somehow we have missed the stealth wealth community? It's, it's, it's crazy to me that this has just gone under the radar. Yeah. I think, uh, the minimalists are, are the closest thing I could find. And, you know, I think that they have some really nice messaging in that, in that documentary, but ultimately it, it really just scratches the surface of what we're talking about here. And this is something that I just feel so compelled to share with the world. And, and I think it will benefit so many people. Honestly, I, I don't mean to have illusions of grandeur, but I think if, if this is, if this was something that was taught in college, in high school, how many people would be less angry and how much better off would we all be? And how would, how, how would we make decisions as a society, as a country, if everybody had this type of knowledge that could really de-stress our lives and get us off of this hamster wheel with which just doesn't seem to be working or helping. And by the way, this doesn't mean that we all need to go quit our jobs and and live on a farm. I mean, that's not what this is about. And some people may do that and that brings them happiness and that's great. But it's not to not pursue things that matter. It's just to pursue them in a way that keeps happiness on the forefront and allows us to to advance in a way that's not also slowly killing us. That that reminds me of something that I've heard Brad say many times, specifically that the less angry part was very striking to me. And I think just separating yourself from that paycheck to paycheck mentality, the other half of what you said is how this is truly life-changing. I think that's what the point I was getting to when I was talking about some of those documentaries earlier. There are lots of documentaries that are informative, that give you information, but there are a much smaller subset of documentaries that are truly life-changing. And I just think to some of the reviews that we've seen on iTunes, how many times someone has said life-changing information. And they're not saying choose FI is life-changing. They're saying this concept, this idea of FI changed my life. It it, it was my light bulb moment. I'm switching up everything because I had this epiphany. And that's what this documentary can be. That's what this idea can be. And the biggest thing is you don't know what you don't know until you do. And I can't imagine a better way to get a message that can change your life than to put it on a mainstream format to get it, to get it into some sort of media distribution platform like Netflix or Amazon Prime. That's exactly right. I mean, that's the goal. And so, and so, you know, I started thinking about the characters that needed to be featured in this documentary. And I think there's plenty of people that I think should be in this documentary, but there's plenty of people that I haven't heard of or haven't met yet who may also very well be perfect for this documentary. I want to be involved in this community as much as I want to get outside of the community and get varying opinions and and get different points of view, but ultimately share the value that this community brings and show all of its reach. And so, yeah, I I reached out to you guys and I know we plan to uh, to film out in uh, Richmond in the coming months. I'm very excited. I've been connected to uh, FinCon in Dallas. We'll be going out there. I'm really excited to hit Dallas. I am going to be joining uh, the first week of the Chautauqua out in Ecuador. I can't wait for that. I'm hoping to meet and get to know a lot of the people out there who are featured speakers and guests and Cheryl who runs it. They've all just been amazing and I can't wait to share that week with them. I have been invited to the Camp Mustache uh, southeast in in uh, Florida and hope to spend a few days out there with that amazing community. And and yeah, and we'll see where that takes us. That's kind of the beginning and, and we're just getting started. It costs a little bit of money to, to travel around and, and put people up in hotels and get an audio tech and maybe a, a PA. And, and there's also the production considerations to take into account. There's going to be gear rentals and, and crew and, um, and meals and all those things. So yeah, hopefully we can raise a small amount of money to make a huge 
impact. Absolutely, Scott. And I, I can speak for Brad and myself that we want to support you in this project in any way possible. And so we are going to do our part to help spread this, hopefully among the FI community in general. So there's more people talking about it. Obviously, we'll be continuing to mention it on our Friday roundups and upcoming shows. So we are thrilled that you brought this this project to us. And and frankly, we're thrilled that you're doing this from the inside instead of someone looking at it from the outside and saying, huh, let's go ahead and film these people and, and see what they're doing inside of this little glass box. This is someone that has found it and you're making radical changes in your own life and you're wanting to share how awesome this journey has been for you with the watching world. And and I think that is the reason that Brad and I are so excited about you being the one to do this project. Yeah, I think it's the perfect story, really, because to imagine that you just found this concept five months ago and you're upending your entire life because you feel so strongly about it, that is really impactful to me. And like we always say here, the fire is spreading, right? That That's our entire concept, because we truly believe that Phi is a life superpower, and it's a way to reframe life where you focus on the important things. You focus on the people in your life, you focus on happiness, and that is why we want to spread this message. And Jonathan and I are very aware, and we try to say that Choose Phi is not about us, and certainly the Phi community is not about us at all. We are just trying to spread this message as much as we can from our little corner of the podcasting world. And I think people are resonating with it like your wife did, right? She heard this message from two just normal guys. And I think people appreciate that. And I think people are going to appreciate your point of view, telling the story that you're doing this and you're traveling around and this is an adventure that's focusing on happiness. And that just means so very much to me. And that's why I've just been so thrilled to learn about your project. And I want to help you in any way that I possibly can, just because I want this message to spread. And I think this is a wonderful avenue for it. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you, Scott, for doing this. And Scott, do we have a working title for this yet? (laughs) Yes. uh, The working title, uh, I believe this idea came out of uh, an email between you guys, right? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, we were, we were joking around and saying, uh, playing, we were playing with fire. And so I think that title is just, it's perfect. We, my wife and I are literally going to go out and we're going to go play with fire. We're, we're sort of, we're taking some risks with our life. Uh, I'm quitting my job. We're uprooting our life. We're moving. Um, and yet, you know, at the same time, I, I understand that, you know, I just pitched that as this is a much easier decision to make once you frame it the right way. But that being said, we're going to go out and play with fire. We're going to go learn more about the fire community and the Phi community. And, and maybe we'll finally put an end to whether it's the Phi community, the fire community, the stealth wealth community. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right, Scott. Well, before we let you go, we do want to offer you the chance to tackle the hot seat. You ready for this? I am. All right, let's do it. In a world drowning in debt and rampant consumption, trapped by the chains of lifestyle inflation, these questions highlight the secrets of those who have broken free. Welcome to the Choose FI Hot Seat. All right, Scott, question number one, your favorite blog that's not your own. Uh, yeah, so I'm not much of a blog fanatic. Uh, my go-to is podcasts, you know, Reddit browsing, book reading, things like that. But, you know, I know this has been said a million times, but Mr. Money Mustache is truthfully the, the number one blog that I check in with regularly and um, have read from beginning to end. I'm not sure there's a substitute that currently exists uh, to grasp this fire lifestyle, challenge your assumptions, you know, kick your ass in gear and, and, and help explain it to others. No, it is good. It's definitely back to the basics and walks you through it. He will face punch you into submission. <laughs> <laughs> of, now, your favorite article of all time, was that a mustache article? It's not, actually. There's a blog, which I think has been mentioned here before, called Wait But Why? And there's an article uh, called Artificial Intelligence Revolution. Mm. Um, and the idea is so mind boggling that it actually changed the way I perceive the world to some extent. And it's a very almost scary article, but it is my favorite article. I I talk about it at a lot of, you know, with friends and dinners and things like that. And the idea is really that we really just need to try to survive until about 2045, because if you make it there 
or so, one of two things are going to happen. And it's either going to be we'll live forever or we're all done. (laughs) Skynet (laughs) is coming. That's right. (laughs) Okay. Well, you know, I think my friends and family are tired of my financial independence dinner conversation. So maybe I can pivot over to something more optimistic, like artificial intelligence taking over the world next time. (laughs) All right. Question number three, your favorite life hack. Yeah. Besides fire, um, which is my all time favorite life hack, I would say meditation. I like to jump on mindfulness, uh, the app mindfulness and just take 15 minutes to myself. It's incredible. It's, it's one of those long term gains that once you do it for a long period of time, I, I don't know, for me, I, I was able to sleep better, uh, interact with people better, have more patience, be more present. And it's just, it's amazing uh, how much we, you know, sort of neglect the, the largest muscle in our body, the, our mind. Yeah, I agree completely. I use the Headspace app and yeah, just absolutely love it. But yeah, I'll check out check out the mindfulness app that you mentioned. All right, Scott, question number four, your biggest financial mistake? Yeah, hands down, it would, it would be the amount of student loans I racked up. I had about 38K to pay down when it was all said and done. And I made my final payment last year uh, at 33 years old. And I definitely popped a bottle of champagne when that happened. Uh, I recognized that that was a huge deal. But I just think about all the the wasteful spending I, I had in college. And um, I, I worked in college, but not enough to actually maintain that lifestyle. So or sub, uh, support that lifestyle. So uh, that's by far the biggest financial mistake I've I've made in my life. You know, our generation is kind of this transitional generation and our things were rapidly changing as we were growing up and, and school was changing, education was changing, the value of education was changing and to put it bluntly, the cost of education was changing. There's so many people that I know personally that came out with $60,000, $90,000 in student loan debt and the estimated income for the job that they got trained for was $40,000 a year. And, and it's almost one of those things where you can never recover from that using traditional methods. Very, very much, it is the biggest financial mistake for hundreds of thousands of people, I'm sure. Yeah, to, to take nearly 10 years to pay off is outrageous. All right, uh, question number five, the advice you would give your younger self. I would have listened to my first, uh, you know, biggest financial mistake and then uh, also invested in property as early as possible my first year of college and let my roommates help me pay a mortgage down. I lived in uh, Iowa City. I went to school, University of Iowa. I lived there for six years and I, I made a ton of great friends who I ended up living with most of the time. So this idea that you could actually live with your friends and, and trust them and, and have them help you pay down a mortgage, that would be advice I would give my younger self and also to own some property in, in the college college town that I love so much uh, would be would just be a bonus. Oh, I love that second look at that particular situation. So you do the house hacking, you bring your friends in on it, and then afterwards you still own property in a college town. Very, very cool. We do have a bonus question if you're up for it. Your favorite purchase that you made on Amazon.com last year, or if you don't use Amazon or didn't use Amazon, just your favorite purchase in general. So um, it's a book. It's called What Do You Do With an Idea by Kobe Yamada. And what I love about this book is it teaches kids at a very young age that ideas are, are special and that one idea can change the world. And it's such a powerful message and really applicable to to this conversation that I just wanted to share that with your audience and say that I highly recommend this book. Probably any kids, you know, around two and a half, three years old is, is a great way, great time to start reading this to them. That's awesome. One additional favor, uh, I really like the idea that you piece together this email that you're that you're using to share with friends and family. Would you mind forwarding us a copy of that email so we can send it out to the people on our email list, just so maybe they can see how you're introducing people that you're close to to this concept? Yeah, I would love that. I I was actually looking for that when I put that together myself because I was just trying to save some time, see if anybody else had already put that together. But yeah, I'd be happy to send my little curated email. Awesome. Well, Scott, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today and sharing your vision. Uh, We will be following you and supporting you with interest and it's going to be a wonderful year. So thank you so much for joining us today. And and thank you guys. Honestly, Jonathan, I, I can't stress enough how much it means to me to understand what I'm trying to do here and, and know what I'm doing. And Brad, your support has been tremendous. And I, I wouldn't be able to do this without you guys. I wouldn't be able to do it without the community. I 
can't wait to start involving the Facebook group and and really the entire community to tell this story. It's it. This isn't about me. I actually struggled with whether to put myself in front of the camera. I just think it's the best route to take to eliminate excuses because we're going to live it. And so I welcome feedback. I relish it. And in fact, it's already starting to happen. You know, the way you put yourself out in the universe and the universe responds. And I have one story I want to share. You guys actually mentioned me on a podcast a few weeks back, which I can't thank you enough for. And uh, somebody here in San Diego was listening and didn't know that I was living in San Diego and looked me up getting excited about a documentary, figured out that I was in uh, San Diego and reached out. And we had lunch a couple weeks ago. And and this gentleman uh, opened my eyes to so many different concepts. Uh, he's already achieved phi. He's already excited about uh, effective altruism and and the lunch was just, it was really rich with conversation. We probably spent two hours sitting there. And I mean, I can't tell you how exciting that was. And it's just an amazing testament to the people in this community and how this thing is already going. So that is due in large part to your influence. I can't thank you guys enough for having me on today and for supporting this. And I can't wait to see what we make. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for sharing. And uh, to our community, again, if you're interested in the documentary project and you want to learn more and follow along the journey, uh, Scott will be sharing updates and what goes on behind the scenes at playingwithfire.co, playingwithfire.co. The fire is spreading, my friends. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.